All right, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, feel free to let me know, please, if um, if the, the sound is is not good or anything like that, I can make adjustments um, as, as we go. Um, please also feel free. I know there's lots of experience in the room. I can just see names. Uh, I can tell that just from the names. So um, please feel free to use the chat to ask questions, to give suggestions, um, to ask aloud. Basically, this is, you know, a, a chance for us to, to have a conversation together. All right, so with that, um, I'd like to officially start by paying respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. And I acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. I pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. And I acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old. And I honour their courageous leaders, past, present and future. Um, and if you're interested, I can share these um, slides afterwards, but nativeland.ca has um, this interactive map that shows all the different um, Indigenous peoples across Canada. And you can really, um, I think it's even beyond that. And you can just ex explore um, a, a lot about um, Indigenous peoples, where people have lived, um, et cetera. So I found that was a really neat resource. And then I thought um, maybe just for five minutes, you know, it's it's been um, a while since we've maybe even seen other people, other families. and so. Uh, what I'll do is I'll invite us just to take five minutes in a breakout room um, to say hi to other people who are here. Uh, the choice is totally yours. So if you're just like working on something else at the same time, grabbing a coffee, whatever, you don't feel like chatting with people, that's, that's totally fine. Um, but I will open the breakout rooms for you to join if you'd like to. Um, and so let's say we'll return to the main room at, I don't know, 10.08. So I'm gonna assign those rooms automatically. Five. All right, and I'm just going to check the settings to make sure you're not going to be thrown into the room. There we go. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, so you should receive an invite to join a, a breakout room. So jump on in and say hello to some folks if you'd like. We'll meet back here at 10.08. And we'll move on. So um, I wanted to share this project um, with everybody and thank you so much, um, so much for, for being here. Um, there's been a big group that had came together to do this project. And so while not everybody is here today, I mean, we've had people from the Teaching and Learning Support Service, from SAS, we've had students on the, on the development and evaluation teams, um, we've had other professors. So you'll hear some of their names today, but just know that, you know, I'm sharing about this growth and goals module today, but there's been a huge team um, behind it. And every time we give a workshop like this or a presentation, we're also listening to your comments and feedback so that we can keep improving it and make it relevant to the people who are going to be using it. So just know that your comments are, are really important um, as we go through this workshop today. So we had set out to address, um, help students address three main problems. And that's the ideas of managing course and life goals and demands, dealing with failure, um, identifying what to learn, how to learn it. And then tied into that were these ideas of um, degree level expectations, both undergraduate and graduate, um, of the ideas of awareness of the limits of knowledge, autonomy and professional capacity skills, um, so skills that we, we know are taught in some courses, in some programs um, that, that, that people at SAS can address. And what we were trying to figure out how to do was to reach um, more students in a more um, consistent and, and scalable way. So that students were going to be able to build these skills um, throughout their university careers and then take it, um, take it beyond that way. We also know, you know, as students are getting into the workforce, you know, this is something just from the World Economic Forum. Uh, but this idea that as pe people, you know, get whatever knowledge they and, and skills they have at university, um, that they're going to keep having to iterate and develop and learn throughout um, throughout their careers. Um, and so what we were thinking about is, you know, how, how do we equip people to do that? We can't give hand people everything they're going to need to know for their careers. How might we help them get build the skills to be able to do that? Um, and so if you've watched the, the video that, that um, the team and I had created about this, I, I just thought that Alex Trebek was such a great example. Um, his show was such a great example of one of these key skills, you know, where contestants are looking at all the categories in front of them and thinking, okay, where are the categories that I really know a lot, the ones that I don't know a lot. Um, you get to that final Jeopardy round, it's like, okay, how much am I going to um, you know, to bet in this final round? Do I, do I need to bet big to win? Do I know the answer? Do I, you know, all these different kinds of things. And so 
this show for me when I, you know, thinking about this really captured one of those key skills um, that we try to teach in the module itself um, around metacognition. So identifying what you know, what you don't know, what you need to know, um, and then thinking about how you might strategize accordingly. You know, we know when as these you know learning systems are getting more and more adaptive. So if I want to learn something, statistics, for example, I could take an online course that might guide me through some of those pieces. But I have to know in the first place that that's going to be a skill that I might need, or I might need to figure out to what level I need it, or really be adaptive in my in my thinking around that. So we're trying to think of how to help students gain gain these kinds of skills. Um, and I'm just seeing the note in the chat. Um, can I show the presentation later on? Absolutely. So I'm both recording the session um, and I'll share it and I'll share the slides. Yeah. Um, when we think about if I actually just flip back to this for a second, so when we think about kind of teaching these skills, most of us in the room, you know, researchers, people who are working in higher education, we're pretty good at learning. We're pretty good at doing this kind of stuff. But the challenges and the challenge for experts in any field is that we tend to have these skills quite implicitly. If you are teaching metacognition in the course, you've learned to make that more explicit. Um, but the other example I think about was, you know, when I decided right before doing my PhD that, you know, I'm going to I'm going to teach English in Nepal. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to be, you know, I know English really well. I, I love people. I'm going to be an English teacher. And so I volunteered for a number of months um, in Nepal and teaching kids, teaching adults English. And, and the number of times I couldn't explain things about the English language. Um, any of you maybe who are or language teachers would know this, how difficult it can be to make um, things about language explicit and also how to help somebody learn those, those things. Um, it, it, it's really, really difficult to make explicit the things you, you really know. And this is one of the challenges we thought around this module and making these learning skills like metacognition explicit is, is how, how do we do in a consistent way, make, make this, easy for people um, to learn about. How do we make explicit our knowledge? And it might be, this is my son skating down our street one day um, a couple of years ago. And you might say, you know, hear somebody say, well, a Canadian delightful great snowfall white. And think, well, that sounds wrong. Um, you know, if you've learned English as, as your first language in particular, and maybe you'd be able to say, well, you know, white as an adjective needs to go, you know, before snowfall, but it may be difficult to say why those other things are, are not quite in, in the right order. And it turns out, and I learned this actually two weeks ago, that, that English has a, a, a rules about the order of adjectives. And I see some people like, I had no idea there are rules about the orders of adjectives. Um, but, but right, yeah, I, I see that comment, yeah, it, who knew? So really, if, if, if you know, you've learned English from a young age, you would hear, you know, delightful great white Canadian snowfall in the same way that you might implicitly intuitively have these learning skills. Um, but we really wanted to make these things more explicit um, for, for students and knowing that most of us professors, you know, I came from a chemistry background. I don't know how to make these things, this, this learning skill thing explicit. So this is where we we're going with this anyway. So we wanted to build a resource that was systematic, that reached, um, reached students in a, in a consistent way, that was scalable so that could readily reach lots of students um, and in a way that worked for people and making these skills explicit. We also had some other things that we really wanted. So we wanted something that would be integrated in courses and aligned with the course learning outcomes. The integrated part was because when we piloted different versions of this actually before building it with students, um, we just kept hearing that they didn't want one more thing, you know, another workshop to go and do. Thank you for being here today, doing yet another thing. Um, you know, another thing, um, another on top of, yet another. And we thought, well, what if we put something on your co-curricular record? What if we give you pizza? What if we pay you? Um, what, what would it take? And what we kept hearing over and over again from students is, you know, it would just be better if it were something that was already in what we're already doing. Um, we wanted something available in French and English, um, and even perhaps in more languages eventually. Uh, we wanted to meet or even exceed accessibility requirements. Um, and we wanted this to be an open education resource. It was, it was really important to us that, you know, we know that things are going to work in different ways in different contexts. And we believe, um, our team believes very much in, in things being, you know, ex easily accessible to educators and to students. Um, and so we wanted this resource not only to be free, but to be readily adaptable. So if there are pieces that don't work in a given context, you know, from science to arts, to social sciences, to engineering, you can change it, no problem. 
So generally speaking, and do feel free to jump in with, with any um, questions or comments that you have through the chat or, or out loud. Um, generally speaking, this is the, the overall look of the module. So it's it's delivered at this time, our third iteration actually now, um, through Pre Pressbooks, which is a web-based tool that it exports to Kindle and Kobo and PDF and other things. Um, and so when students start the course, they would do the biggest chunk of the growth and goals module. So some theory, some interactive activities, we'll do pieces of those um, throughout our time in the next 40 minutes or so. Um, and then the course you know, kind of progresses. Then before each assessment, major assessment in the course, and that would be you know, the course professor up to the course professor to decide what that assessment you know, is and how that growth and goals fits. But say for my courses, often it's a midterm. And so students would use then this piece of the growth and, goal, growth and goals module to identify how they're doing with respect to the course learning outcomes, reflect on some learning strategies, et cetera. They do a reflection piece after each major assessment or major time point um, in the course. And then same thing before the final assessment, kind of a, a take, taking stock and strategizing going in. And then this last piece, oops, is both a reflection backward, how did that go? but also a prompt to think about this forward. How are you going to take this in the future? What do you still need to learn? What have you learned that you wanna be sure to, to take forward um, to your other courses? Um, what's worked for you, what's not, et cetera. So that's generally how it fits within the, within the semester. Just pausing to see if there are any comments or questions so far. How, how can we integrate this in, uh, in Brightspace, for example? Mm -hmm. So the, the easiest way to integrate it into Brightspace is to make a PDF of the Pressbooks um, file or just to give what I do is just to give students um, a, a link to it. Um, you can there's also more advanced ways, I guess, to embed it directly if that's something that you wanted um, wanted to do. The activities that the students do are through Google Drive um, right now. That was the way that we've, we piloted a few different ways. And this was the way that we found was was the easiest um, for for both for educators and for students to adapt and then um, um, translate. So we actually have full video text instructions um, that I'll share at the very end um, in order to do that. And is it a, you know, a, an all or nothing deal or can we pick and choose different activities? Because I'm looking at your uh, slide right now and it's interestingly, I have a similar component already in my courses. I asked them to identify learning objectives uh, and to explain how they intend to reach them. And those are personal learning objectives. There is a midterm self-eval and a final one. So I already have those components, but I'm interested in maybe adding a few more things. Um, is that something we can do or you would rather us use the, the entire uh, package? So the short answer is you can use it however you want and you can you can mix and match however you'd like really however you'd like to do it um, one of the things we are also doing is an, is an evaluation of the module meaning looking at how, how well it works in what context for whom it works um, as well as to what extent educators have changed it um, when they've adapted it to their courses and what we've found so far for that part is that educators who are who haven't had anything at all in their courses before tend to just almost drag and drop the module and then they incorporate their own learning outcomes sometimes, but usually actually creating learning outcomes for the first time so far. Um, for professors who have had those pieces in their courses before, um, they've done more of a drag and drop kind of, kind of piece. And even within the activities themselves, um, which I'll show you, you can change the, the um, line items themselves as well. So it can be as simple as drag and drop, or you can really tailor it as much as you want. Um, and I see the question, um, how many hours are necessary for the students to go through the module? So they report it takes um, one or two hours at the very, um, at the very start. And then some time, um, much less time than that um, before and after. And it's interesting because they say, yeah, it takes a bunch of time, but it was really worth it. But it took time. And it does, it's, it's, it's learning something new. Um, you know, it, it's challenging them to think outside the box. We get comments like students like that saying, I didn't like identifying things that I wasn't good at, but in the end, it made me work on that thing. So. Um, sorry, again, to clarify one thing. Please. So you say that uh, the prof can drag and drop any piece of the model to the brightest space? Mm. To so my knowledge, you need to add as as admin of this model because i'm doing something similar with the library mm -hmm. so what they did i added they they provided me with the with the link and they added me at their um 
I, I think I was appearing with my TAs as guests. The only thing, because uh, they cannot see my student, I cannot see their model without this. So tell us a little bit more about this uh, strategy that you've used, like a little mm -hmm. bit more details, if it's possible. Yeah, so I am going to be showing you um, pieces of it, but the, the main idea is that you would be working in, in press books is the easiest way. There's many different ways. So I'm just telling you one of the ways. Pressbooks is the easiest way and you can add, type in new things if you want, videos, images, interactive activities. You can delete things if you want simply by selecting and deleting just like you would do in a Microsoft Word document. Um, you can integrate in, in directly into Brightspace. That takes more work. Um, we wanted the press books. Uh, our first version was directly integrated in Brightspace. And what we found was that it was actually a lot harder for um, professors to change the different components. This is why we went first to another thing and then to press books um, because we're finding it's the easiest for people to uh, adapt. Thank okay. you. So if you have more questions about that too, I can, I can answer them when we get to that, um, that section as well. We can definitely get into the details. So just aiming now to look through some of the components of the module more specifically so you know exactly, or, or, or at least more, more specifically what's inside the module. Um, so it really has a framework around self-regulated learning. And so this is an iterative cycle where students are, are continually reflecting and then planning and then acting and then revisiting that before and after assessments, before and after a final um, or final assignment, final project. And the, the real idea here is equipping students with the skills so that they are in charge of their choices. It's them setting the goals. It's them choosing their strategies. Um, it's not us trying to tell them how, how they should do it, but saying, you know, here are the skills to do it. Now you make some choices for your own learning. Um, and so it starts out with a reflection of tendencies toward learning. So we use, you know, Tracy as a sample student who's preparing for her upcoming exam. And the students start with a checklist um, that they see early in the course and then later in the course. And so they might, you know, um, identify if they see any similarities but between themselves and Tracy, such as not setting any goals, just telling herself to do as well as she can, um, having no specific strategies, planning time, cramming. So there's some phrase more positively, some phrase more negatively, but it's just a, kind of a taking stock. What do I do right now in my learning? Um, and then we start to get into beliefs about learning. So here are four examples. And what I invite you to do um, is to head over to menti.com. And you can answer these um, in terms of your own beliefs, or you can imagine what a student might think and answer in their beliefs. It's really up to you. But I'll invite you to head over to, to Menti and, and submit actually your, your, your answers for these. So the menti.com is a website and then the code is um, available in the chat. Just watching responses roll in when we're we have a number of them in. I'll I'll share the screen as well. There's no kind of maybe answers here. It's either true <laughs> or false. It's it's a true or false. And you I mean this is one of the things you could set up to to put a, a maybe in there, um, some of the ones in a bit, and I think you're able to auto advance. Some of the ones do have a neutral kind of position if you'd like. Okay, I see about half of us have answered here. So I'll jump us over. Okay, so here's what our answers are looking like so far. Most people saying metacognition can be just as important as intelligence. Um, individuals who set specific goals are more likely to achieve these goals. Um, 
And also in the positive or true side, strong learners seek out help for, from others. And so within the module, we also have references for the, the feedback and the responses we give. Um, and then more people saying false, the professor is responsible for teaching me and making sure I learn. And you might imagine this is a really great time to have some conversations about teaching and learning with students in the class. Um, and one of the things students um, in all the classes we've, we've looked at, it's been thousands of students now, um, really like being able to hear what their peers are saying and hear their professor's opinion on these different things. They, they are really, you know, even if it's like a five, 10 minutes, even before a class starts or at the start of a class, um, as a break in the class, mm -hmm. um, they really like being able to have this discussion and hear from, from the professor and their, and their peers. And this is one of the, you know, the bases. And, and in my own class, for example, around the professor is responsible for teaching me and making sure I learn. Um, this get, you know, really great conversations in class and debates in class of, you know, what's the professor's responsibility and what's the student's responsibility and how do we meet halfway and who, you know, this, this sort of thing. So um, it's really good opportunities in here. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the main. Emily, I missed it. Were you going, was there gonna be a comment there or maybe I just saw a hand movement out of the corner of my eye? No, okay. <laughs> I was about to say, though, for that, that third question, it's kind of two questions in one because I was kind of puzzled because, yeah, yeah I, it, it really depends how you look at it. We assess and, you know, we, we teach the material, but it's up to the student to take stock of it. So it's a, I was a bit puzzled, but yeah. And, you know, in, in our team, too, we had the debate of, you know, do we really put a two-part statement in there? Because if we were doing, um, you know, it's more it's research on the social science side, we wouldn't want to have a, a kind of a two part statement like that, because we could really you know, end up with a mix of results. Then we, you know, we said, you know what, we're going to leave it in there because it generates such great conversations um, that, you know, from a, from a research perspective, it's not a great item, but from a conversation perspective, game on. So, and again, something you might, might want to change or might not to as you were, as you were incorporating it. Teaching, teaching and learning are two different things. It's part of the conversation too, yeah. Yeah, and the conversation about, you know, what the professor's responsibilities, you know, cr creating a framework, how far does that go? Where's the boundary? Um, it's gonna vary for professors. There's, there's, I think there's lots in there. Present these, these questions to uh, to the students like right from the get-go or, or do you do a short presentation on growth and goals and then present this? Right, so the, the baseline way that, you know, the, the, the the default, I guess, is that students do this in the first part of the module. This is the second activity they do right at the start of the course. So in the first couple of weeks of the class. And then the kind of the next level is whether or not the professor decides to have the conversation about it in, in class or not. You know, like, like with any of these parts, it's totally up to the professor in the course. We do hear from students. They love having these, these conversations. I have a question. How can I see the results that the students will have for my question or for mm -hmm. my course? So if you decide to use the module, you would actually make a copy for yourself of all the activities and all the students' responses go to you. I wouldn't have any access to them unless you choose to give me access. So where can I put that copy to be public? On Brightspace, uh, for example? Is it possible? You, you would link to it through Brightspace. Yeah, I'll have some of those instructions um, uh, at the end okay. for you. They're also available in the first section of the module. Yeah. Okay. And Emily, I think you had a question or a comment this time if I didn't. Uh, yeah, well, I was just wondering that third question that has, you know, sparked some differences between us. Yeah. So I wonder how different do you find the student's response on that to professor's response? Mm. Um, I guess the opposite. <laughs> you know, not. It's really interesting, and and so I don't know if we if we have um, a, a, any uh, psychology experts in the room too. But when when the you know, and I really rely on, on this because as coming from the chemistry background, but starting to look in the literature on this, some of the things that start to happen is that when you know students don't do well. That reflection piece, and one of the things we're trying to do in the module, can either say, okay, I didn't do well on this thing, the prof prof professor didn't teach me well enough, so it's this external kind of blame, or the conditions weren't right, or you know, this other thing happened. 
Or wait a minute, what about the things that I could control? What did I do that I could have controlled differently? And so it's, it's this, you know, these different attributions that start to become important in these, in these conversations. So students are, it's varied, I would say, from this, the students' perspectives. And it depends on the context as well. I have a quick question. Uh, how long, how many hours would require us, the professors, to uh, bring in the model to our bright spaces from yeah. your experience? Mm -hmm. Because so, everybody going to start teaching next week. Yeah. So right? for that report, it takes um, one to four hours to do it. If you really just do drag and drop, um, some people have not even put in their own learning outcomes. It's ideal too, because that's what we're asking students to rate their abilities on and really reflect on. Uh, but that's the very, you know, the lowest end. And then, you know, if you're developing learning outcomes for the first time, that'll take some time. If you already have them, it would take a couple, a couple of hours. So professor, professors have reported one to four hours. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. And then some people weigh more, right? Because then they get, we suck them into the project. They get involved, and all of a sudden they're spending many hours working with us on. on yeah, I, I, I used to topics. to use uh, like monkey surveys for my courses. Mm -hmm. like online when we started doing them um, but like on weekly basis and uh, like oh yeah my it's really team, only yeah. one to four hours setup time once it's running it's just if you decide and it's great if you do if you decide to mention it bring it into class I set myself reminders to to bring it into the class um, and then at the end it's probably you know an, an hour maybe um, to look at the completions from the students. We've actually just simplified that. So I, I don't have the newest numbers, but it's been about an hour to put together um, all, all the marks, depending. And on this will work as a complementary to the formal and informal evaluation that we do normally with, the, with like from the university, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, it's not connected. Complementary. Yeah, it's not, it's not connected. This is really for the students learning. No, no, complementary. The main idea of the formal and uh, informal, so sometimes we tailor up questions and right. uh, it's only for the prof. Sometimes or all, all the times we do a formal evaluation for our courses where we allow our student to. Mm -hmm. So this is for me, it's kind of like um, tracking and evaluation the course with a little bit more structures methodology, what you are offering. You can think of it that way. Kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. But beautiful, so, sounds interesting. Uh, thank yeah. you. Um, so after we start talking about then the beliefs about learning, uh, we actually have a, a collaborator uh, who's at Trent University, um, who has brought in concepts of mindfulness as, as well. Um, so the idea of, of present time awareness, um, thoughts and feelings, um, accepting those thoughts and feelings as natural products of your mind um, that you can observe and let pass without becoming entangled, distracted and off track. And so this is the idea that when students are feeling you know, really stress out of control, um, that things aren't going well, much, much like we've seen, you know, in, in the pandemic and the many different things that, that students are experiencing. Um, this has been brought in as a way to help students um, both accept and take back some of that, that control of those, of those feelings. Um, so there are a couple of different mindfulness activities that exist uh, that are in the module. Um, this is part of one of them. And so I think if you, um, advance the slide and some of you I can see have already done that it's great so this is what the students would be doing as as part of the module and so I can right away just share what this is looking like here so this is totally anonymous by the way it's not connected at all to your participation in in, in zoom um, but we can see we, we, you know, we have, we have a, a range. So even within the people who have, who have answered this in the room, you know, finding it difficult to stay focused on what's happening in the, in the present. A um, little more coalescence around um, experiencing some emotions and not being conscious of it until some time later. Um, so this could be something, again, it's, it's kind of like a conversation starter. Um, so it's awareness for the student, but then also a conversation starter if it were brought into the class. Um, oh, here we go. And so then around mindsets, again, this I could probably just board right over to that one. So thinking in particular, if you're answering this question, think about one thing in particular that you do. And so it could be 
skiing, or it could be your research, or it could be uh, teaching, um, teaching the course that's coming up. So we ask students to think about the subject that they're taking um, and to rate their agreement with, with each of these statements. And there's a series of about um, 10 of them. And it's been really interesting to see, um, so I can just say that most people right now are, are disagreeing with, with the statements that they, so they don't give up. Um, they believe you can change your abilities. And um, for whatever subject we were thinking about, I'm not a, I'm not a skiing person. I'm not a math person. I'm not a, um, so this is one of the key ideas in the, in the module. Um, and the key, one of the key ideas here is that in a fixed mindset, students or, or people believe that their basic abilities are just fixed. You're good at something or you're not. You're a chemistry person or you're not. Um, whereas in a growth mindset, students understand their talents and abilities can be developed with goal setting and effort, um, et cetera. And a couple of, a couple of things then to note on, on this idea of growth and fixed mindsets. Um, People can hold different mindsets in different areas of their life. Um, we offer, they, the research shows that in, in, um, with students and with academics, it's the challenging situations that really reveal um, the student's mindset around that given area. So when they get to something hard, are they giving up or not? Um, are they seeking help or not? Are they deciding, oh, this is hard and therefore I must not be good at it? Um, or, oh, this is hard, so, hmm. And I want to learn it, so I'm going to dig in and learn it. Um, a growth mindset is predictive of better academic outcomes. Um, a lot of that research has been done only with K-12 students, so there's a lot of room to do more research um, in university settings. Um, so a number of the mindset interventions have been effective, including in really big groups, again more for K-12. Um, and instructors mindsets matters too, which is both great because it means we can have an impact on students and how they're doing and also um, a bit terrifying because if, a, if an instructor has a fixed mindset and believes that if you're coming into my class and you're either good at this or you're not, um, that will affect students in, in the class. And so this is really double sided um, as well. So what we encourage students to do is not just to have a growth mindset about everything, because I think you'd be like you'd be stuck and you never get anywhere if you're like, I'm now going to have a growth mindset about holding my pen and I'm going to hold it perfectly. And, you know, like every single thing, you'd be there forever. Um, but to choose, like, you know, is this something that you want to improve? Does this fit within your goals? If so, then having a growth mindset about it is going to help you in that case. So it's, again, it comes back to being mindful and being purposeful. Can we make the question related to the course? It makes yes. like more sense to be related to that particular course. Is that, is that possible? Absolutely. And so when we go back to, oops, that one, uh, my ability in this subject, you can change the word subject. Uh, when a problem gets really hard, I give up. And so it may be that you're working in a discipline where it's not so much problems that you're working on, uh, but other kinds of challenges. And so you can tailor that to frame it for the kind of challenges that you face in that course. In fact, we encourage you to do that. We try to make it like easy and generic, but it's, it's much better for the students if it's, if it's tailored. Um, so we talk about the importance of, of failure. Um, and, as, and as researchers, like this is what you live, right? Like that experiment didn't work. That thing that I tried, well, that we're going to have to try that again tomorrow um, or next year if, if that's when data collection happens for, for some, uh, some things that we do. So it's, it's this idea of, of not only normalizing that, but also ideally then creating opportunities in the course to, to fail safely, to learn, to grow through that. Um, and then the next part of the module talks about some strategies of changing that fixed mindset voice. Um, so interpreting challenges, setbacks, criticism, um, rather than just thinking that it's telling you that you're just not good at something and that it can't be changed, rather that it's an opportunity to grow and stretch and expand. Um, I will say that um, growth and fixed mindset does get, this idea does get criticisms at this, at this point um, because there are sometimes there are just systemic barriers that really, you know, no matter how much you're like, I'm gonna grow with this and I'm gonna get better, that there's things that just stand in your way that are out of your control. And so that's, um, you know, that's something I think to be upfront and realistic with, with students about, about too. 
Sometimes it's the system that needs to change. And then there are some examples of ways to both identify the kind of thinking um, that you're having and then, and then change it. The other critique of, um, around growth mindset is that, oh, I just need to like immediately switch to a growth mindset and everything will be better. And again, it's not, you know, it's not instantaneous. It's a process. It takes work. It takes time. Um, but the, the results coming out of um, some of the research around here are really exciting. Um, so then we get back to the metacognition um, idea, and I've actually grouped together some things that are sprinkled throughout this initial part um, of the module, but it asks students about things that they value, and this is really big picture, like is it family and pets or athletics or music or, you know, anything, but what's important to you, and then starting to narrow down from there, what, then what are your priorities, um, now let's get into the course, narrow, narrow, narrow. Um, and so a couple of things here, we asked the students to rate their abilities on the course's um, prior knowledge learning outcomes. So here are the things you should know coming into this course. And the students for a lot of ways have really liked that. One, it tells them really clearly what they might need to review um, or if they've come from another institution, um, they haven't taken that particular, you know, the one that we would anticipate um, prior course that they would have taken. Um, this can be a really helpful way for them to get kind of get up to speed. Um, especially early in the course when they, you know, they're not facing some of those big um, assessments or challenges yet. And then as the course progresses, you can continually build in the relevant learning outcomes that you've addressed um, in the course. And then the idea then is to take those, take some goals, we'll get to that in a second, and ultimately decide what to do for your learning. Um, so it's just an example of what this would look like. So here are some of the prior knowledge learning outcomes that come from my course. Um, these are some things that students should be very quick and easily able to do. So it gives them an indication of like, oh, if this is hard for me, I really need to practice it. Um, and then there's some prompts that ask them, uh, I've taken it out, some prompts that ask them like, how do you know this? Is it intuition? Um, have you self-tested so that you, you know, really tried to measure it? Have you explained it to somebody? How do you know about, about this? Um, and then we get into the plan phase. So they've done the reflecting, they've done some learning about learning, and then they get into the, the really nitty gritty action part for themselves around setting goals, priorities, strategies, identifying resources they're going to use, how they're going to manage their time. So this is the nitty gritty kind of part. So we ask them to set SMART goals. Um, first, identifying from just a, a vague goal, whether a goal is SMART or not. Um, and then to set goals for themselves. And what we find here is that students tend to set these really broad, you know, I wanna, here's what I wanna do for my career, or, um, you know, I wanna get a certain GPA. And so asking them then to take those bigger goals and narrowing them down into finer grain goals and even as far as going to subtasks. And then self-evaluating their goals to make sure that it's specific, measurable, um, that they're accountable. Some say, students say they wanna be just accountable to themselves, um, reachable and time specific. Uh, and then Shana, who's a student who worked on the team um, over one summer, uh, so she created a video explanation of how to plan your semester. So starting from things like required times, you know, the courses, the practices, um, building in time to eat, to rest, to play, again, reminding students to base these on their values, priorities, and goals. Um, I have to say that I, I guess I continue to be surprised at the student feedback on this one, that they hadn't thought to plan their semesters in this kind of way. Um, to, to really, you know, be purposeful about kind of the big picture semester, the week by week kind of breakdown. Um, and this is, so this is one of the parts that students report loving and taking into other courses every year. Um, and then we get into the time to, time to act, where we invite students to keep thinking about how they're progressing towards their goals and the course's um, intended learning outcomes, and what are they doing to achieve their goals. Part of what we have in the, in the module is a list of resources um, like student academic su success services, um, health services, uh, mentoring, the kind of resources students might use. And again, which can be tailored to your own faculty or course or setting. Okay, so that brings us all the way, it finishes up the, the, for sure the, the course beginning part. Um, just gonna touch on a little bit of the assessment before we get into some of the final bits. So 
before each of those assessments, um, the students are asked to rate the abilities on the course learning outcomes to date. Um, they're asked how they decided. So, and a lot of them at first say intuition. Um, you know, I just had a feeling about it, which again brings up a great time in class to talk about, okay, well, how, how might you really, you know, test yourself, explain it to somebody else, try something out to really, you know, know um, how you're doing against these. Um, deciding what to do about that what learning strategies to use, um, and then what comes up next. And then after each of those assessments, it's reflecting. So how did that go? Is that working for you? What, are, what about your goals? Are, do you have any changes to make? Uh, what supports are you going to seek? What are your next steps? So it's continually prompting students to, to reflect on these different pieces. Okay, so that's the end of the module description. I have a, a couple slides just talking about some of our evaluation results. Um, and if you do decide that you wanted to use the module, it's really helpful for us um, because it's an open education resource. It doesn't automatically, you know, we don't track sales, we don't track uptake, but it is helpful for us to know who's using it because we're really trying to understand who it's, who's, you know, who is it working for, who is it not working for, in what context. Um, so what you're seeing are some results from uh, now a couple of thousand students out of the five or 6,000 now who have used it. Um, so we know participation rates are excellent if you give a mark incentive. And it only has to be a 1% bonus. Some people have gone up to 10%. Um, but as soon as we hit that one or 2% mark incentive, we're getting really, really great completion rates. Um, if the module doesn't have any marks associated or if it's introduced late in a course, um, the participation drops below 30% and then kind of tanks by the end of the, by the, end of the course. Uh, students have get told us really great things, inc including um, our Science Students Association who have encouraged us to get it into, like, they basically said, we want it more courses, we want it program level, um, let's make this that much, you know, that much bigger, this is awesome. Um, so 82% who believe the, student, the module will improve their learning. 79% um, who would recommend to a, a friend or peer. The other thing we see is their metacognitive skills um, improving very quickly. So it, we've looked at how accurate their, those ratings are against the learning outcomes by comparing to how they're doing with aligned questions and exams. And initially their accuracy is really, really poor. Um, it kind of looks like a scatter plot, uh, you know, uh, just like drop sand on a graph kind of, kind of data. Um, but we do see their metacognitive skills improving really quickly. Um, and in particular, what we see initially are very strong students underestimating their abilities and the lower achieving students overestimating their abilities, um, which is was commonly been observed in, in psychology. And what we're seeing though, is those ratings become really, really accurate, um, except for the students who are getting under 25% um, overall in a course. So all for about the very lowest students, they're getting like bang on accurate by the end of a course. And we think that's pretty, that's that, that was so exciting because that means they have the tools in their hands to decide what to do, what to do next. They know if they know it or not. And then it's just about them getting the strategies to decide, you know, the what next piece. Um, so somebody asked the, the how much work um, question earlier. So this is a bit more, a few more details. So one to four hours, um, you're adapting the existing template. Um, no other major changes to your course unless you, unless you choose to. Um, so we do provide instructions and support. Um, in fact, as, as soon, anytime we have a student on the project, sometimes they've actually done the modification. So the professor has sent, said, here are my learning outcomes. The student on the project has tailored it to their, you know, the module to their course and said, does this work for you? And the professor after that can tailor it. So we're hoping to get another student on the course sort of mid-winter um, and through the summer to be able to offer that support again. We don't have one at the moment. Um, so the results get exported to spreadsheets. And so I basically just say, you know, here's your student number. I'm going to say, yes, you've, you know, give you a one because you've completed it and upload that in, into Brightspace to give the marks accordingly. You need to decide what percentage of completion um, you know you want you want to give for that, and then you can reuse it in future years. So in future years, I I essentially don't make any changes unless I've made some changes to the learning outcomes or I want to tailor some of the items or things like that. So it's really easy to reuse in future years. 
some of our team members, we've had so many team members over the years, but these are these are some of them. Um, we have also a couple of collaborators at, at Trent University who are not um, not pictured here, um, who are include helping us work on the mindfulness piece, resilience piece. Um, and the next stage that we're looking at right now is around Indigenous knowledge. And so we have a couple of people who are reviewing the module, um, including Brenda McDougall here at, at UOttawa um, around Indigenous knowledge. And we also have an Indigenous pedagogy expert at Trent um, University who's helping us out with, with that piece. Because right now, we, we you know, it's just something none of us in the team had the expertise to do it. Um, so we're, we're hoping that's another piece that we'll be able to incorporate in the module. Okay, so with that, I wanted to pause the next couple of slides basically say you know here are the links here's some brief instructions um, how you might value the module in the course but i wanted to pause here and kind of give it a break point in case anybody has questions they want to ask um, and then i'm going to hang around for the next hour for anybody who wants to get into the more details but i'm pausing do you have any questions or comments that you'd like um, to ask. And I see some great stuff that's been sharing, um, shared in the chat. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'll build that into the stuff that we share back with people who couldn't attend um, in person. Yeah, hi here. Um, thank you, Allison. This has been really great. Um, I have a question just regarding, uh, just to make sure that I'm clear about the tool. So basically, it's a template that can be modified without any copyright concerns. Yes, I'm not yes. I'm nodding along at all the things that, that you've said. That's exactly it. So okay. let me just um oops, I accidentally went to Brightspace. I think I must have Brightspace on my fingertips instead of the module itself. Um let's see, course integrated version. Do a new share. I'm just gonna show you what the module looks like here. So you would essentially come and you'd be in Pressbooks. Um this is a, a tool that was developed especially tailored out of Ryerson, but then now offered uh, for free through eCampus Ontario. And so you, as I'm just looking at the actual version of the book, but you'd be in the admin portion of it. Um, and then when you get to it, you would just, you would make a copy of this book and then it's now yours. So you would then be able to adapt it however you want. Um, you would make a copy of the activities. So we have the activities on Google Drive as Google Form activities. You would make a copy of those that you can adapt them so the student data goes to you, not to me, um, and, and modify it in that way. So as the students get into it, we actually have information for professors at the start and that has all the instructions. And then it gets into, when I click on next, it gets into the student facing piece. So any of this, it's, it's it works just like a Microsoft Word document. So when, when you're in the editing part of it, you can, add, delete, add photos, add videos. Um, there's ways to add interactive questions as well through a tool called H5P. Um, so there's, you know, you, you can really make it however you want. And like you said, with, with copyright, so the, the license we have on it is called a Creative Commons license. Um, so you, we ask that you give attribution to the team, that it never be commercialized, because it's really important to our team that it be, that it be free. And then if you're going to share it forward, that you just share it with the same licensing. Okay, and it's also available in French, is that correct? It is available in French, yeah, French and English. Okay, yeah. okay, great. Okay, and from what I understand, if we do choose to use it, you would like, um, it's not an obligation, but you would appreciate if we did share our, our um, results with you, correct? Yeah, it would be, it, it's really okay. helpful. So we also, in parallel with our development team, we have an evaluation team. Um, and we have an ethics exemption to that. So we always run everything through our research um, ethics board. Um, so we have an you know, official um, ethics exemption for that because it's a program evaluation. Um, and so what we're doing with, with that is looking at who's participating, who's not participating. Um, are they achieving the intended learning outcomes? Um, for the professors, what's working, what's not working? If you use it once, do you keep using it? Um, so far, uh, the vast majority of educators who have used it have continued to use it. Um, so that's a sign that it's working for people. It's not just like, oh, I tried that once and no, thank you. I'm not gonna do that again. Uh, but for most, most people continue, continue to use it. So this is the kind of thing that, that we're looking at with, with the module. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for those questions. I appreciate it. Alison, Aria here. I kind of have a similar, along the line, a similar question. Uh, okay. Melina asked that, uh, you know, towards the your presentation and also the document you're showing right now, it seems that 
it seems to me that we all we are um, re model, but I wonder what kind of an artifact is the model? Is it is it an Excel sheet or or some software or or is just a pure methodology idea? Um, you know what I mean? Like I, I don't have a perception of what 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 you mean by the model. Yeah. Um... So maybe if I drop in, you'll, I just dropped in a link directly to the book. It'll take you to this chapter that I'm on right now. Um, so the students would would go to this web page. Um, you would create a version for your course, but they would go to the web page and they would work on it. They could, you know, we have glossary terms defined, and so the students would do this. And at different points, so say here on this page, when you have your version, you would put in a link here to a um, a Google form, which is a, the activity that they would do. So we have those activities already created. Um, you would make a copy of them so they become yours and you can both adapt them and collect your own student data. And then the students, they would be like literally on this page, they would click on the link to the activity, do the activity, and then keep on working. Ari, does that answer your question? Yes, so, so the activity would be um, you know, more specific to my course than anything else. It's it's an open-ended um, subject or uh, the activities subject. are pre-built, and so I had. To, let me pull up one of the examples here. I'm just looking back at the PowerPoint as I scroll through. So the activities would would be variations of. My mouse just disappeared. Sorry, my mouse has just disappeared. There it is. So the, the activities are pre-built. Um, in fact, the only one, the major place you would need to make any changes for would be the prior learning outcomes, unless you're also teaching uh, an organic chemistry course. Uh, but the students would, would go to these Google form activities and they would have these questions lined up for them that they would answer and then submit and move on. And you would get a, rec um, a record that they had submitted them. They put in their name, their student number, um, their email address. So you get confirmation they've done it and they get a confirmation they've done it. Let me see if I can find maybe one more. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so there's another example of one that, of an activity that they would have right in the module. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's not clear to me uh, who is the administrator, who is the user, like how, how can I be the administrator? I get a copy of the book and uh, all of a sudden I'm the administrator since I'm the one who is going to post it. Is that, is that how it works? That's exactly it. So if I go into admin, oh, and you can't see it, hang on. And Jeff will go to you right after this. I'm seeing your hand there. Just sharing, okay. So if I go back into Pressbooks, so in the administrator view, um, I have many more options. Uh, one of the options though I have is to um, clone a book. So I would clone or make a copy of this particular of this particular book. There's a little quirk in, in press books that you'll see in the instructions just to make sure that happens smoothly. Um, and then at that point, you'll be able to go, let me see, make sure I click on the right version of module in any context. No, cool. we have a module for any, the version of the module for any context as well, because we've had some athletes and some people in other settings. Um, uh, special services, for example, who wanted to use it, but course integrated version. Course integrated admin version. And so now I can look at this and make any changes that I want. So if I go into the reflect phase as an example, um, I'm able to delete things if I want to. I can make any adjustments just as if I was in a Word document. When I put, you know, a, a link to that Google Drive activity, I would, um, I would copy and paste the link to that. So we actually have video and text instructions that go along with this that are that it would be step by step to walk you through any of those changes. Alison, I have a question. So let's actually go to um, Jeff first, and then I see Mads, and then we'll go to the next person. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, two two quick questions. Um, the first is how much time will this take the students in total per semester? And the second question is, um, given that you, your team seems to be continually updating these documents, 
and given that like I'm, I'm not going to be teaching until next fall when would you recommend that i try and integrate the documents right um okay so how much time does it take students students tell us it takes a couple of hours for them to do especially the initial part um and then about half an hour before and after so like kind of in total before and after each assessment about half an hour okay but per semester uh, for the students you're asking per yeah. semester? So I guess each time they do the module, that's how much time it would take them to work through everything. Some report taking much longer to that, but they are like digging into the details. They are, you know, they're kind of going above and beyond and, and others take less than that because they're just click, 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 clicking because they're not really invested. And that's kind of where the, you know, professor student roles kind of starts ends. Like here's the opportunity you choose whether to, to take it or not. Um, with some students who have seen the module in multiple courses, that's where you as a professor could say, okay, you've seen it in another course. I only need you to do activities two, five, and seven. Um, we're also looking at a program level version of this because of um, a lot of the positive feedback we've had from, from educators and, um, and from students, um, but that's not ready yet. So, so, okay, because I was a little bit unclear because it sounded like the module had three parts that you would have at different parts of the semester, but now you're talking about it as if they're doing it once. Uh, they do, so the students do, a, so the module spreads through the whole semester uh -huh. and they do a part of it very early on in the first couple of weeks. They do part, part of it before and after each assessment and part of it before and after the final assessment. And we call that one module. I see, I see. And that whole thing would take three hours or so. Yeah, that's okay. what they're recording to us. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. And then you asked us like, oh, the second question was when to incorporate since we're making um, continual updates. So it's up to you, really. I mean, you could take it at any point. The version that we keep on Pressbooks is always the most up-to-date version of it. Um, we do also, I would have to double check that it's still active, but we do have a mailing list too that we can send out periodically to say, hey, new version is, is there if you want to, if you want to take a look. But the next major changes we're looking at um, would be the Indigenous knowledge, resilience, and then program level. But otherwise, everything has been pretty consistent at, at this point, because the feedback we got from the last iteration of focus groups with professors and students have been quite positive and stable. So there's not, to this part, there's not massive changes coming. Okay, thanks. Yeah, for sure. And Mads, please. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, I was caught up in another meeting, so I missed the first hour of this. Is the recording available? I w yes, we have been recording and I will make it. I'm gonna work with the Teaching and Learning Support Service with Nancy and make it available, figure out how to make it oh, available. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, and, you bet. and the second the second thing is that um, um, I'm doing a um, an experiential learning program, um, which is not a course, it's not a credit course. Um, but students that are participating um, are participating for a whole term and they need to create a um, individual learning plan during the first week of the program. And I was just thinking about how, how you, in, whether there's any support from your team that might be available to see whether we can adapt the model to, to that kind of framework. Hmm. So you're saying, so students will need to create them for themselves an individual learning plan. Yes. Um, together with the advisor, right? Um, so so they, they will have a faculty advisor and they, they will set some, um, uh, depending on the project that they're working on, they will need to identify what is, you know, where are they now and, and what are the skills that they want to acquire to, uh, in, they need to acquire in order to meet their project goals. And, mm -hmm. and, and so it's sort, of, it's sort of very similar, but, 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 but it's not very clear to me if I have the expertise to sort of change, make the changes that would be useful for you for um, helpful, um, right. and, and I was wondering whether whether there is whether there might be some support for me, additional support for for, for that 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 kind of initiatives. Yeah, so there's this is great. So there's there's many thoughts here. Certainly, things something that we could discuss um, discuss further. Um, we do have two versions of the module, so we have a course integrated one, but we also have a course independent one, and so the course independent one might be an interesting one that could, you know, where you could get the students to do it, all the activities are independent of a course and the students could use that to create their own individualized learning plan. Um, mm -hmm. 
So there's, I, I guess I, I'm saying there's different different ways to go. We could definitely discuss it. Um, discuss okay, further. great. Okay, so so let me yeah. let me watch watch the webinar first, and then I'll get back to you. Okay. Okay. So when I uh, we've seen it with my team. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Perfect. So folks, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be staying here um, until I have the time blocked off until noon to answer any further questions. If people are like right now, you know, trying to integrate it, you're welcome to that. I can help answer questions along the way. Um, if you're ready to move on with your day and to, you know, to go to the, go on to the next thing, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and maybe I'll just stop the recording at, at this point, but just know that I'll still be here for, for questions and all the things. Thank you. So